Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. My name is Will Critchlow, founder and CEO of Distill, uh, and joined today by Stephen Cumberbatch, founder and CEO of Conversion.com. Uh, yeah, so uh, we're going to be talking about 10 things you're probably not testing, but should be. Uh, but before we kind of get into that too much, we're going to just start with a little bit of introduction, a bit of the basics. So, Conversion.com, elevator pitch, who are you, what do you do? Sure, so Conversion.com, we're an agency focusing on conversion optimization, funnily enough. Um, so we help clients with experimentation across uh, customer experience, um, also pricing and product. So we work with brands across across the world, primarily in the UK, um, across all levels of maturity. So people are just getting started with their CRO experimentation program all the way through to companies who've got in-house departments and who are looking to scale up in terms of strategy, expertise, and delivery as well. Fantastic. And part of the reason that we're running this, and uh, th this whole thing is a bit of an experiment, because we've not done one in person live like this before, no. and uh, I'm sure it's going to go great. Uh, but um, yeah, we at the store, uh come from the SEO side of things, and uh, the little shout out that we want to give is tickets currently on sale to our conference search club in Boston, which is just in uh, the week after next, so distilled.net slash events. If you want to join us there, uh, also on for London, which is later in the year. Um, but yes, we come from the SEO side, but we have been getting more and more into SEO testing, and we've been investing in building our SEO testing platform, which is uh, the ODN, the Optimization Delivery Network. And so, yeah, we're running SEO tests, and all of these things are starting to uh, kind of come together. We've been learning from the methodology, like where you guys have been building hypotheses and all this kind of stuff on your side, and it also overlaps because we're getting to run tests where uh, we do what we call full funnel testing, which is where we get to uh, collaborate on stuff. So we, we can test conversion rate impact mm -hmm. and SEO impact independently and together uh, and see what the net impact of all that stuff looks like. Very cool. Yeah. So uh, we're going to chat through some stuff. There's a bit of structure, but we're also probably just going to talk some nonsense as well. Um, and uh, I guess I did just want to quickly at the beginning outline, I think most people are probably familiar with how you how you guys kind of implement mm -hmm. your tests? Yeah, because uh, you're generally, I guess, running this stuff uh, client side. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you want to do the really quick version of that? Yeah, sure. So, we are focusing on uh, experimentation, typically on our clients' websites. Um, the way that we do that is we will use a third-party platform uh, like um, Optimizely, Mandate, BWO. Um, a third-party platform that is posted on the client's website and that allows us to uh, modify the DOM so we can manipulate HTML, or CSS, JavaScript without our clients, developers needing to get involved. So it makes it very easy for us to split test changes. They can be really simple, like changing a headline, changing an image, all the way through to completely redesigning an entire page, putting in new functionality, um, testing pricing, testing new products. All of that is useful because it's often far easier to make a change through a testing platform compared to actually baking it in permanently, which means if you're testing out new functionality, it's only quicker for us to test it, prove the value, understand how it should be implemented for our clients and get further. Yeah, that makes sense. And the um, in contrast, the way when we run an SEO test is the big difference is your stuff is generally not indexed, not visible to Google. Yeah. And so we're making changes server side, and that's what our platform enables us to do. Um, and rather than splitting the users into cohorts and testing some of your audience versus uh, the rest of the audience, we're splitting the website. So mm -hmm. we're, we're taking a site section, group of pages, for example, product pages on the e-commerce site, yeah. making changes to some pages and not to others, and using similar kind of statistical approach uh, to what's expected to your tools mm -hmm. to um, tell whether Google prefers one or the other. And then when it comes full funnel, we're layering on top of that a kind of cookie thing so that uh, you get a consistent site-wide experience depending on whether you landed on a controller or a variant page. Okay. Um, and then we can test both. We can test conversion impact and you know, So yeah, that's, um, I guess, the, the background that perhaps um, people need to know. What we thought we'd get into before we get to the headline 10 things you ought to be testing is like how do you go about building successful tests? Mm -hmm. And so this is stuff that we you know, relatively new to us that we've been yeah. learning from some of the stuff you've been talking about. So how do you start? How do you think about that stuff? So for us, the first thing that we spend quite a bit of time doing with our clients, if we, if we start with a new client today, for example, the first thing that we would spend time doing is understanding what their 
what their goal is and what their KPIs are, which sounds very obvious, it sounds kind of trite. Um, but actually, when you dig into it, the goal that a client comes to us with is often different to the one that they should be optimizing for. So if, suppose they're an e-commerce website, um, they might think that their goal is to improve the e-commerce conversion rate, for example. Um, but actually, when you dig into it, you can see that they might have a revenue target for the business that they're looking to hit. And yes, the conversion rate is going to be a key part of that, but it's not necessarily the one and only thing that they should be focusing on. So we might need to break it down in terms of, you know, should we be looking at revenue per user or AAV, conversion rates, um, other, other factors, should we be focusing on profit instead of revenue, for example? Mm -hmm. So understanding the goal that we want to achieve is key. Obviously, it kind of goes without saying, but actually most people miss it. So we find that and it's kind of the kind of thing that you want to get right from the start as opposed to backtracking for six months down the line. I mean, we're super used to that side of things because we have people coming to us with everything from we want to rank for this word to we just want more traffic. You know, they're often, yeah. oftentimes the things people say they want from search are even further removed from mm -hmm. the real business goals. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, I think it's about some things. And then from there, so once you know what you want to test, if your goal is to come up with the, the concepts, obviously you want to understand what is essentially what is stopping you from achieving uh, from achieving that goal, what is affecting the current performance of that KPI. Um, typically, it's going to be a combination of two things. One, um, you need to look at your website or the digital experience. So it can cover the website, email, push notifications, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Uh, and on the other side, you've got your customers, and you need to understand both of them. So you need to understand how the website is performing, where the opportunities are, and be able to prioritize that effectively. And you need to understand your customers in terms of what's stopping them from achieving their goals. Is it that they lack motivation? Is it that they lack the ability? Are there other factors at play? Mm -hmm. The way to do that is obviously with quantum and quantum research, but then it has to be validated with the experiment. So that will give you enough of the data and insight to come up with a good idea. Mm -hmm. Typically, the, the next stage that we would then talk about is refining the ideas, because often People have a tendency when they're coming up with an idea to test. They think, okay, we're going to do a test on the shopping basket, and all of a sudden, everyone starts to kind of pour in their ideas for things that they want to test, and you end up with this kind of hideous, conflated mm -hmm. multiple different hypotheses. Yeah. You come up with this kind of weird mess of a test. In fact, what you want to do is come up with a hypothesis. So, what are we trying to prove? We think that the reason customers aren't converting from our shopping basket is because of X, and whether we're going to test that. Like a lack of trust or uh, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Exactly so. And then you come up with it, um, as we put it, the, the boldest experiment you can for that, delivered in the simplest way. So okay. getting the balance right between the two. Yeah. Um, so typically we, we talk about things like the, the, the best next mm -hmm. test. You don't want to come up with the perfect test, because typically doing something like that would involve a huge amount of work to, to get there. Instead, you want to see if this is going well today, that's where you want to get to, let's do a test one step in that direction. There's a value to speed. But you don't want to trade off the, like you said, the boldness of it because yes, it's exactly might be able to measure it, but you might not be able exactly. to test it. Because obviously going from here to here is going to take up a huge amount of resource. But if you're going to go from there to there, mm -hmm. then you can do that ten times over, and then you can see which experiments work and which don't. Whereas if you just if you place all of your um, bets on one horse, yep. you're going to you're going to risk the, the broader success of the program. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, and how do you? Balance up. So we, one of the things we do is we we think obviously our kind of industry on the, on the SEO side has less of a history of validating because yeah. right, it's been hard to do. Yeah. And so there's a lot of I mean this is partly where some of the problems in SEO come from the kind of snake oil reputation, yeah. the, uh, all that that cycle, and also the kind of dark art mm -hmm. element to it. Um, but nonetheless, we, we essentially are going okay. We've got some uh, theoretical reasons why we think this should work. You know, yeah. Information retrieval kind of theory that this will this will make our page more obviously about the thing yeah. that we're yeah. uh, targeting. Whatever, and um, we'll have some that is, that are based off the uh, maybe best practices or you know, urban myth. So you know, I guess all those things are on a spectrum from validated best practices yeah. to somebody some guy said sometime, and that probably includes also like official statements from Google, mm -hmm. which necessarily will take a face value either. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we've got all that kind of stuff, and then we might have prior experience, or you know, we, we saw this on this other place. How do you think about, um, for example, suppose your your customer research is coming up with um, a particular challenge. Yeah. How do you then go, how do you get from the challenge to the 
to the solution. To the yeah, to all the hypothesis. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a really good question. So it's um that is where it's I guess more art than science, mm -hmm. I suppose, because you're absolutely right. Like you can use customer research to determine why people are behaving in a certain way or what's stopping them from converting. But to then take the leap from that to come up with a solution, yeah. because obviously any one problem can have hundreds of different possible solutions, mm -hmm. and some will be really crap and won't work, and others will work really effectively. Yeah. Um, that's definitely the, the challenge. Um, in terms of how we do that, it's I guess it's based part on part on experience and part on creativity. So I guess for us, we have a framework that we use to approach experimentation, where that essentially takes care of a lot of the the structure and the rigor behind experimentation. And that means that because that is all neatly ordered, it means that we can then invest a lot of time in the creativity and terms of coming up with the experiments. Yep. Um, typically, we find that, that we've got a few different ways in terms of how we approach um, ideation. But one of the benefits that we have is because we work, we all work in one office, it's very easy for us to collaborate very closely and often to take ideas from completely different websites. Yep. So we will, um, uh, they won't let me forget it, but when we, um, when we first started working with UNICEF, I made an analogy between their website and their gaming website. Um, Funnily enough, charities and gaming websites are on the face of it pretty pretty dissimilar. I don't I don't know quite how they took the analogy <laughs> at the time, but actually there are some real similarities. The same way you know, we'd look at the, any kind of subscription website, whether it's um, SaaS, food, or in this case a charity, or gaming, anything that kind of um, wants to drive the ongoing customer behaviour. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of similarities between them, and so that's the other advantage we can take, which is rather than looking at your nearest competitor to see how they do it. We've got experience working with so you're wildly outside that. Yeah. Exactly. And that's when you can start to come up with um, pretty interesting ideas. Yeah. We we encourage people to be pretty um I guess bold and interesting. Like you don't want to make a kind of tiny little tweak to an element and cross our fingers and hope for the best. We want to do impactful changes. And so sometimes that can mean like, you know, what if you know, like there's what if statements. Like, what if we instead of trying to solve this problem, we just removed it altogether? So, like with one um, with one SaaS client, we found that their customers didn't know the difference between plans that they offered mm -hmm. because they couldn't choose between the different functionality. Right. So we then worked with that client to see uh, what would happen if we moved to a completely different pricing model, where the functionality was no longer an issue. Mm -hmm. Instead, you get all the functionality in every plan, and you have to choose based on pricing. That's why based on that, the the bottom of usage right. instead yeah. of the usage. Yeah. So rather than asking people a question that they don't know the answer to, I was going to one and said, turn it on its head, and that's, I think, um, more than doubled new revenue or revenue for new customers. Absolutely, yeah, fantastic. So yeah. It's, it's a combination, like there are always kind of, if you take that problem, like people don't understand which functionality they need, there are obvious things that you can do to try and yeah. um, address that, or you can just... There's a lot of things that add complexity, or yeah. stuff where you're like, oh, we could explain it more, or we could yeah. call out these things, or we could... You know, yeah. Yeah. The plans or something, but yeah, I, I like the, the creativity of that going the other way. Um, good. Uh, so, should we do some um, actual test ideas? Or, sure. Or, or, yeah, I've got kinds of tests. So, uh, yeah, we can kind of go back and forth and, and, and see where we get to. We, we promised to have it, so we can get through some. So, uh, the, yeah, do you want to kick off? Talk, talk about something that, something that people aren't testing that, that you think they should be. Yeah, for sure. So, when, um, when we were talking about this before, I I don't want to come up with a kind of this crappy, HTML elements or something. Well, yeah, pretty much like you know, test your headlines, yeah. test your images. Like it's it's all pretty boring and obvious. Um, so I've been trying to think about it a little bit differently. So one that I wanted to start with was um, what are the things in a company where people do something because we've always done it that way. Yeah. Um, so there are. There are things like this in every single company, and often it's the thing that holds the company back. The assumptions that are ingrained in a company. Um, so there's a guy who um, set up and run the growth team at Facebook um, called Chamath, who would talk about law, as in L O R E. Yep. Like the things that are. The people have forgotten to question. Exactly. Yeah, exactly so. Um, so, like, uh, it's funny, like when we, um, we, we talk with Justine, and they, would, and they have a. Um, they don't have a five-star rating, they have a six-star rating. We're like, 
why, why is that? Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's an example of one of those things that it's, it's done that way because that's how it's always been done. And um, maybe there was a reason. That exactly. Was I think it was, I think yeah, it was maybe not correct. Exactly. I think it was probably more that. Um, so as an example, we've been working with a um, fashion retailer recently, and they um, they allow you to customize your products um, based on a couple of different measurements. Um, sounds a bit weird when I phrase it like that. Um, but we found that actually by testing on that, that they're giving people more choice than they needed, and they're actually making it harder for their customers to choose. Okay. So by testing it, we can see how they could potentially not only simplify the product page and the category pages, but they could simplify the entire business because they're potentially producing 2x or 3x as many products as they need to because they're giving their customers more choice. Mm -hmm. But this was something that was relatively unique to their business. It's how they'd always done it. Yep. It's how they've done it for over 100 years, mm -hmm. literally. Um, but it's one of those things that we can test and we can see what the impact is of removing that. And I think that's what we like about experimentation is it, kind of, it doesn't mean that things are, I guess it puts everything up for discussion. Everything in yeah. the, um, can be challenged. Um, and it gives you a, it allows you to take risks with a safety net, I guess. Mm. So you don't have to assume that things are done the right way. You can challenge yeah. them and put goals and yeah. come up with better alternatives. It was that made me think of something I did. Uh, as you came into my head when you were talking earlier, but you mentioned the quantum qual when you're doing your initial research. A lot of the measurement when you roll out this stuff is quite quant. Yep. Do you do qual later? Do you, do you kind of uh, see, see how these things have landed? Um, but, I mean, quantum qual should be present throughout, mm -hmm. as in we want to understand why customers are behaving in a certain way. And I mean, they don't know, right? But. Exactly. Um, that's the thing, like, it, it comes down to how you. How you run those sessions and how you interpret mm -hmm. that, that data, um, because it grabs you. Know, people don't necessarily know, but it comes through observation and, I guess, interrogation of the responses. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I'm just thinking it's something that is the way they've done for hundred years. It's quite baked into their DNA. Some of this law is baked into the DNA. Some of it is will be stuff that users don't care about, right? Users are probably not attached to the sixth star on just these, yeah. but some of their users might. Or customers might be passionate about the fact that they can customize yeah. the product in two different dimensions. You know, what, what about fallout from that? What about the you know, any kind of like uh, figuring out how people are going to take it? If you, you know, even if the stats are moved in the right direction, right? Even if yeah. your conversion rate is improved, your revenue is improved. It's a fair point. I mean, ultimately, it comes down to what you want to measure and what you want to improve. Yeah. We're mindful that there's obviously a huge focus on customer experience, and rightly so. Mm -hmm. But that can often be like a, a kind of get out clause for people who want to do something that flies in the face of the data. Yeah. Um, so we believe that, yes, there are ways to kind of gain certain metrics mm -hmm. um, and, and to, to drive them in a, in a certain direction. But we'd always look to see, um, ideally, that the long term metric, uh, the better. as in if you can focus more on lifetime value than a in session. Yeah. Event, for example, essentially yeah. people clicking on a button or something, get it. Yeah, so, exactly. I think it's, it's kind of similar to get on both sides of the fence because we, we have to be mindful of the, you know, you, you could do some shady tactic that might get you ranking people doing short yeah, term. Exactly. Uh, right. And there's same with like a dark pattern on your yeah. side, I guess. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the, the first one I wanted to mention, uh, which is kind of obvious, I guess, from the, the background and the intro, is just headline SEO is a thing that people should be testing, but they're not. Um, and uh, as in like H1 tags? Or no, I just mean that my first uh, overarching point was ah. SEO. It's okay. a thing that people are generally not testing, but they generally, okay. generally should be. Uh, it's not possible on every size website um, to test you, so you, the impact of the changes for certain yeah. performance. Uh, but I think a lot of the stage, a lot of the times when you're able to test, in other words, when there's enough traffic um, to be, you yeah. have to get statistical significance. Yeah. Those same people could, in theory, be testing uh, from an SEO perspective. The, the exception being some of the kind of B2B SaaS kind of things with too few pages. I was going to say, so I think where we're relying on a certain number of users, presumably you're relying on a certain number of pages based yeah. around a similar template? Uh, yeah, so it, it, we test on per site section. So, yeah, so, so, it, so it's pages of a similar template. And um, but the our main our main rule of thumb is that if you've got a site section which is comprised of um, many pages, right? So it's not uh, 
three page section of features yeah. or whatever. And that site section is getting you know, anywhere up to like a thousand plus organic visits per day, the words visits from organic search. Yep. Then probably testable. Uh, it kind of comes out to whether our model can um, uh, reach, uh, can, can, can model the traffic to that site yep. section well enough. And, and I, I will think if we're getting enough organic traffic to the site section, it probably is. But it is possible that if there are too few pages, that can screw it up as well. Because yeah. just one page doing better or worse can exactly. skew the data. Um, so it tends to be, you know, we talk about e commerce, real estate, um, travel, jobs, yeah. any, any of those kinds of uh, sites that have. Yeah. Uh, also, um, uh, physical retail, so locations okay. is another one where yeah. you know, if a site has hundreds of stores, whatever, then, then that works pretty well as well. Okay. Um, and yeah, the, the industry on the SEO side has had, like, there have been times when there's been a bit of a testing mentality, and so the, it's something that people felt used to be there more in, yeah. you know, in the good old days uh, of people testing on their private websites and, and those yeah. things. Those are, uh, it's kind of different. How thing. scientific was that? Well, so, um, not <laughs> generally, <laughs> but uh, that's not to criticize it, right? You know, there's, it, it's, I think it's probably the equivalent of some of the kind of qualitative research that you might have on your side of things. It's like, mm. it, it generates anecdotes rather than data, yeah. but it does yeah. at least give you it's better than nothing. You know that something changed, you know yeah. that something moved. Um, in certain cases, if you do it, if you approach it well, some of them can be quite scientific, right? You can turn a thing on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, and see, yeah. the, see the result coming. Presumably in those days you were focusing more on rankings than traffic, whereas today people's, your search results will be different to mine, so you can't necessarily rely on. Yeah, so I mean, there's that factor. Um, as it, so yes, I think. Uh, also, in days that have gone by, we had more data about that stuff, right? You, we had keyword data in Google yeah. Analytics, for example, so you could you could see the whole um, universe of keywords that were sending you traffic. Now you have to write search console data, which is no idea as comprehensive and so forth. Yeah. Um, we also think that when we base our results uh, primarily on the traffic, not only for that reason, but also because um, many of our hypotheses are about click through rate from the search results as well. Yeah. Um, and okay, so like uh, modifying the cycle tag. And yeah, exactly. And if you think about paid search, think about yeah, how much yeah. of the effort in a paid search campaign goes into tweaking the advert, and how little of a traditional organic search campaign goes into tweaking the organic advert, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a, a, there's a huge opportunity there for um, many, many mm. sites that we work with. It's also one of those areas where absolutely need to watch it closely. Those have been our biggest uplifts and our biggest drops have been changes to the title tags or the meta information. Okay. So the way it looks in search results can yeah. be you know, plus 25%, it can be minus 25% as well. Nice. And uh, the, the um, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Don, who gave a talk at our conference about things he's learned in a year of um, SEO testing. Yeah. And he starts with this kind of set of funny anecdotes about essentially being asked to write a better Title tag template yeah. uh, and failing repeatedly, basically having a bunch of tests that were worse than the original. That's and then uh, Tom Anthony, um, who uh, was the um, uh, runs the product team and is kind of uh, the, one of the driving forces behind our MVM platform, came in and was like, uh, "Don, none of these tests are working. Let me have a go at it." And his was the worst one. So uh, yeah, it, it's, 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 it, it's hard to. I'm sure yeah. that's a lot where you, you can't. But, you swan in and you, and you uh, write the test and, and they get your badly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, so um, what's the next one? Next point, good question. Um, so the first one was looking at for things that we've always done it that way. So what's the, the law within the business? The second one is um, looking for what are the kind of the internal political issues within a company. It's mm -hmm. like when two people or two departments or two teams have wildly different opinions on how something should be done. Yep. Um, so there's always talk about how we can make experimentation part of the culture. Right. And people see experimentation or optimization as this kind of bolt on activity, which is always like third on people's list of things that they care about. Because Number one is things that are on fire, or things that are broken that they have to fix. Then there's the new stuff that they're building. Actually optimizing what they've got already feels less interesting. Like, yes, yeah, somebody should do that. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's never the priority. Yeah. Um, and so when you try and create this culture of experimentation, 
you're always trying to say, oh, we changed this on our product page and increased sales six percent, which everyone should be thrilled about, but actually they just can't with a daily, daily job. Mm -hmm. If we if we take that point, so what are the political issues or what are the kind of internal conflicts or discussions or disagreements, then it's a perfect opportunity to bring experimentation. Yeah, exactly, because it's not about people sitting around a table debating who's right and who's wrong. Yeah. It's about letting the customers decide. It's about putting the customer at the heart of the decisions that they're, that they're making. And so we've done this with a number of our clients, like playing the kind of the neutral Switzerland, I guess, um, and taking the the ideas and principles from both sides, using that to create an experiment mm -hmm. that everyone is happy with, and then putting it to the customers to vote with their maps. How do you find the losing side takes that? Good, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's been it's been really positive in the um, kind of leading to cultural change, actually leading to them kind of being less resistant to some of that stuff in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also um, it helps people understand the framework in which these decisions should be made. In that we should be the, the person that we should care most about is the customer. It's not about what you think or I think or what Tom Anthony thinks, even him. <laughs> um, it should be about the customers and what they respond to. And I think that's always one of the challenging things about experimentation to accept. I'm sure you see it in SEO as well. There are the uh, gurus who mm -hmm. um, will have their theories and they like to say, they like to do that might but they like to say, this is the truth. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we see the same thing. And it's I think it's very challenging for, for people to, to accept, certainly in business, where people get promoted based on their performance and everyone looks to them to point yep. the direction that you should move in and just take a step back and say, actually, I don't know what we should do, but I think we should test it. Mm -hmm. is, um, it's yeah. not always easy to think about. Right, 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 yeah. sometimes. Yeah. It's interesting because the uh, we, we talk sometimes about the different ways of that a company's culture can which essentially which division dominates the company's culture. Right. So traditionally Google was a very engineering driven culture. You look at somebody like um, uh, I guess unsurprisingly somebody like Salesforce, a very sales driven culture. Yeah. Uh, there are other teams where it's, it's obviously driven by marketing, it's obviously mm -hmm. driven by uh, the way they present themselves to the outside world. Uh, we've often thought that as is quite a kind of consulting driven mm -hmm. um, uh, culture internally, it's still, I think, kind of no great accident of kind of where we came, came out of, but that uh, you start using those tools everywhere, and that's for good and bad yep. sometimes, and that's the kind of often the, the dominant decision making format. The, the other one then is you look at the, the intersections between departments, and so you know, sales and marketing, the classic kind of. Um, sales is saying the leech is sending a crap and marketing is going, why are you closing um, yep. more business? Or uh, you know, product and engineering, or sales and product. Uh, and like th in those little, I feel like in those intersections are where you're going to find yep. those interesting, interesting things. things. Yeah. Uh, it's like, oh, yeah, marketing sale, so saying that sales is not closing anything, sales is saying the leech is crap. That's where you can. Yeah, that's it's, where it's a very fair point. It's, it's, it's very true. Like, we, we see that all the time with any. Any lead gen website that we work on, yeah. they will typically. Like, like, yes, you said there's more leads, but they're all crap. Hopefully, they're not saying that, but there's always a discussion. Like we are, we, we we want to simplify the user experience instead of mining mean something basic like um, reducing the form complexity, reducing the fields. But actually, they're useful clarifications. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's always a bit fun in the in the balance. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah what a uh, side note on that is, I think um, it's a very human tendency to shy away from those points of conflict. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's where some of the most yeah, interesting sure. stuff in the business is happening, I think. Yeah. And, uh, you actually need those people to get in a room and push it forward rather than, yeah. like, I think it's dysfunctional if they just kind of retreat into their own. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as soon as you get a kind of consensus decision by its nature, it will water down yeah. any idea or any concept, and, and the, the value is in the, the extremes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so the next point I wanted to bring up was uh, this is. One of the old school SEOs out there is, uh, I think, anybody who's worked in search has, at some point in their career, made a keyword research driven recommendation. Keyword research is one of these, kind of, you know, SEO 101, your first yeah. six months of the job, you'll absolutely be handed a keyword research task. And so, this is you, know, you go and you see which ways of phrasing things are more common, mm -hmm. and it's a little bit like your kind of customer research. Yeah. Super valuable for that. And it's a great form of quantitative data. 
the challenge comes, what do you do with that? What, what recommendation do you make off the back of it? And I feel like pretty much everybody who's worked in SEO and we're 100% uh, guilty of this is you make a recommendation that says something like, uh, you're currently phrasing whatever it is this way on your website. It turns out that the audience searches this way. You should change your phrasing. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very standard SEO recommendation. The uh, flag that I wanted to bring here is like, that's been the source of some of our biggest negative tests. Um, and so uh, you know, an example, I, I think the one we've used, we used a normalized one, because one of the biggest ones, people don't like talking about negative tests. <laughs> so this is a, a, an analogy, it's a made up equivalent of the real test we ran. But it was, um, if you search something like, uh, what TV should I buy, um, versus uh, which TV to buy, or you know, it, was, it was some variation like that. One of them is, five times more searchable across the whole product set. And it's like, this is the dominant way that people are searching for this. You, the customer, right now, are the sort of client, rather, are phrasing it the other way. Testing changing that was a minus 25% organic traffic to those pages. Um, for, I mean, and, and there's a, a few reasons for this. It's not necessarily that the original data was wrong. Oftentimes, the more searched for phrase is also the more competitive phrase, right? So you're moving from, dominating a smaller niche to being a small fish in a big pond, mm -hmm. um, it may sound, it may harm your click-through rate. So the less searched for one may actually be the more, the more compelling one mm -hmm. to see in yeah. the search results page. Um, and also, this goes back to the not provided problem, you have no idea what it's doing to the, the rest of the universe of keywords. Human research by its very nature tends to look at the, the dominant search patterns, yeah. but there's this huge long tail of other ways that people search for roughly the same thing. And sometimes by yeah. moving to the dominant search pattern, you cut off some of the long tail because you, you're, yeah. you're removing extraneous words, you're phrasing it in a very kind of specific yeah. way. And so uh, yeah, obviously in any given case, you have to dig in to find out why that happened. But yeah. we found that it's actually, it's more like writing a better PPC title than it is about human research. Human research is very valuable for understanding what yeah. pages should you have, where are you missing content, uh, all of those kinds of things. But it's not a great way of writing title that point, yeah, for instance. Which is sometimes controversial, but I mean, it, it's, yeah, it, it, it's great when you have a test and you can see the actual data and see the results. Yeah, sure. In an academic sense, it's even good if you've got a negative test. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, exactly. It also doesn't necessarily always make all the stakeholders happy, but at least you know what not, not to do. I think it, it, it makes perfect sense because I think when we see it as well for, because There'll only be a fraction of people who are running those experiments, and everyone else. And through through the the dart the dartboard, and they might be minus twenty five, or they might be plus twenty five, or somewhere in the middle, and they yeah. they don't know where, where they are, where they could be. Mm. Yeah. 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 Uh, I want to mention if anybody wants to ask us any questions, we're going to try and take uh, a few questions in, in a minute. Um, so if you can do that either on the YouTube chat or uh, at Distill on Twitter, and we'll collate a few of those. And, yeah. See if there are any good ones. Number three. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so the third idea that I think most companies should be testing is the product itself. Mm -hmm. So one one of the most interesting experiments we've been running recently is on uh, is helping a partner of ours decide what product to launch next. This is a well-known brand, typically with age old ones. I think it's time to create a new product. Okay. Um, so it involves a lot of market research, um, a lot of focus on creating the right version of the product, so the best product at the, at the right price and so yeah. on. Um, a lot of focus on the on the marketing and refining the entire product proposition and then rolling it out. And then after all of that, after 12 months worth of work and however much investment, mm -hmm. a week later or two weeks later, they find out whether they were right or not, whether they're the last terabyte. Yeah, was a waste of time or not? Yeah, absolutely. And so what we've been doing with them is essentially saying, well, there's a better way that, that you can do this, which is to use experimentation, not surprisingly. Mm -hmm. um, so with them, we've been working to um, A-B test, essentially, what would be a fake product um, on their website, because they get a lot of traffic, and we can measure the uh, the through or the basket rate for a fake product. Yeah. Because suppose you've got three ideas for a new product, and you can only launch one of them. If you um, 
create an experiment. We've got four variations. We've got control, new product one, two, and three. Then you can test all of those three new products. You get exposed to a small percentage of your audience, and you can see what the fit through would be. It might be you get 1%, 2%, and 10%, and you know which product you should be launching, yeah. as opposed to gambling, rolling the dice, spending a year working on a new product, and then realizing that you yeah. picked the wrong one. And back to your bold hypothesis, um, are the, in this example, are they quite similar things? Are these variations on a product, or are these entirely yeah, different? It can be whatever, yeah. it can be whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So in the, and one of the tests we've done recently has been variations yeah. around the thing. So which, um, which kind of product combination is going to be the right, yeah. the right one to, to launch? I'm, I'm talking very um, I deliberately to avoid that. Yeah, um, <laughs> can't talk about this one. And all, actually, I mean that's that's for another reason as well, which is that people are always hesitant to, to do this kind of experimentation. They feel like basically, isn't that a crappy experience for the customer? Like you're showing them there's this product, and as soon as they add it to the basket, you say, "Sorry, this product is coming summer 2019." Mm -hmm. It's not like it's a bad customer experience. Yeah. To which we would always say, well, what's the worst customer experience? Like annoying a small or mildly frustrating a small section of your customers for a week or spending the next 12 months of your time and resources into building the wrong product. Yeah. It's much better to do a, a test like that and create a product that people love and want. Yeah. And what's your favorite landing page when they, when they click on that? Uh, the fake product? Yeah. So, what, 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 do you have a call to action there, or uh, do you explain what you're up to? There are a few different ways you can do it. You can say it's coming soon. Um, I know the, the Guardian are really good at doing this sort of testing, mm -hmm. um, and they will be a bit, a bit more transparent, as you probably expect them to be, in terms yeah. of with, um, yeah. with well done, your test. test. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, other people will say oh, um, this product is not ready yet, but give us your email address and we'll tell you when it is. Yeah. That yeah. sort of thing. So, there are different ways you can. Um, can address that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll keep cracking on. Um, the next one I wanted to talk about was uh, a more technology oriented one. So, um, websites are increasingly reliant on JavaScript. And this is a very good thing. You can get a much richer user experience, and uh, that's great. And it can range anything from an old school kind of progressive enhancement through to uh, a website that actually doesn't work without JavaScript all the way to something that looks much more like an application mm -hmm. just server or whatever. And in paint alongside that, Google in particular, but all the search engines that have kind of said, well, we're going to need to understand some JavaScript to understand the modern web. And they're in various stages of kind of maturity of that. Uh, been various workarounds over the years. Google in particular has, has got quite a long way ahead. And uh, you know they've recently been talking about how Googlebot is headless Chrome and is now the latest version of Chrome and, uh, and all the rest of it. Um, and what we're seeing though is that even if it works, you know, e even if your JavaScript is getting understood by the search engines, it can still be a negative factor. Or rather, it, it can still underperform a website that has the same content yep. uh, delivered straight into the HTML. Yep. Uh, and the, again, there's various re hypotheses or reasons why this might be true. I think one of the, the two main ones I have, one of them that we, we know to some degree is true is there is a delay. So uh, Google has kind of explained a little bit about how this works is Googlebot will come and get your, um, your, for your website. And then there is a later process that does the rendering. And that can be days later. And so if your website absolutely relies yeah. on that rendering process, then that content is not showing up for at least some period of time. And there's various reasons why that could have knock-on effects. So, for example, if they're not discovering internal links for some period of time, it could mean they're much slower to call your website, much uh, much less quality getting passed around, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If it's actual keyword-rich content is missing, it's missing for that period of time. Uh, that's one impact. I think there's also the possibility that they just that there's just some ranking factor element to it. You know, yeah. There's just yeah. a, humans prefer it if it's there in the first page load. Um, mm -hmm. So the the kind of the Somewhere between urban myth and best practice recommendation, I think, would just be try and have everything present in the HTML on the first page load and progressively enhance with JavaScript and maybe allow second yeah. page navigation to pull the content in through JavaScript rather than um, you know, in asynchronous fashion updating the URL. Um, our tests have basically shown that's supported by the evidence. 
that it is a uh, we, we see performance uploads from doing that. So is that something that people should test or just do? Um, well, I think the this is probably where we start getting into the kind of full funnel end of things. Yeah. I think we probably need to test if it's if it's a positive user experience on your site, then you need to know is it worth it for the trade off? Yeah. Uh, because there are times when this can be a slick user experience, or there's reasons why. I know. Also, I guess it, it, it's not. There are reasons why you might swing the other way. For example, um, speed of development. Right? So maintain. There are certain situations where you can ship faster if you're only maintaining the JavaScript version and not having to maintain the JavaScript version and the service up version or whatever else. It might be flakier. There's a variety of reasons why you yeah, might go one way. So what you want to do is quantify that. Okay. Chat, yeah. That, that yeah. drag essentially, and say, uh, is the other bit worth yeah. the drag of that side of things? Yeah, that's a, that's a good. That's a good point. I guess the, the analogy that we see is often when we're talking to, in those terms of um, this is what we think we should do, and that could be us saying it, or it could be our part saying we want to make this change. Yeah. There's no point testing it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Then the, the point that we come back with is even if that is true, and you're making quite mm -hmm. the assumption in, in saying that, but even if it is true, it's still good to know like if you make this change and it's positive, is it two percent? Up or twenty percent up, mm -hmm. because your entire structure is going to be different. Yeah. And often it seems like we're just being sticklers for experimentation in doing that. Actually, it has a massive impact on the on the structure because it shows us what some of customers. This comes back to the hypothesis thing. You, you weren't just throwing mud at the wall in the first instance. You actually you had a hypothesis. If you validate that, yeah, you can make smarter future decisions. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. You do your talking. I'm going to collect some questions. Cool. Yeah, sounds, good. Come in. sounds good. You do your next one. So the next uh, experiment idea that so we've, we've spoken about, uh, what are the things in your company that you've always done that way? Um, what are the internal political issues um, or, or dis discussions or disagreements in the company? The third was looking at what are the new products that you're going to launch and how you can use experimentation to inform that to help you create better products for your customers. The fourth one, um, we would look at essentially what are the biggest investments that a company is making. So it's one of the questions that we ask when we're kicking off with a new client is looking at what are the over the next 12 months, 24 months, what are the uh, what are the investments that you're making? Is it in new product? Is it in certain marketing? Um, because we think that's what experimentation should focus on. It's essentially how you can use experimentation both to inform those investments, but also to prioritize them as well. Um, so we don't think of what we do as, I guess, like tweaking a tweaking a landing page. It's not about refining a headline or a call to action. It's about using experimentation to create better products to inform and to prioritize everything that we do. So we can use experimentation to inform what a TV commercial should be, for example, whether they even um, would be justified as a whole world apart from testing individual elements on a on a, on a website. Nice. Uh, I've got some questions. I'm going to do my one, and then we'll sure. uh, we'll, we'll come to that. So the um, actually almost overlapped into this one when I was talking about the last one, which is one of the common uh, other kinds of progressive enhancement type of stuff that goes on is a very common thing is content that is uh, not visible in the first page. Mm -hmm. So it might be in the HTML, but it's in a tab or an accordion. You know, it stand out with a plus button or a read more link. Any of that kind of uh, thing for a legitimate reason. You know, there's plenty of good reasons why you might have content. We're in not talking white text on my background here. <laughs> three, days, three thousand pixels off to the right. No, yeah. you know, uh, but those days are gone. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's, there's legitimate reasons why you might have uh, content yeah. um, that isn't necessarily visible for user page loads. The, um, the official one at Google is as long as that's not abusive or manipulative, that's fine. But it don't don't sweat yeah, it. Yeah. Um, the result of our testing is that's not the case. There are um, a variety of, it's not always the case that it makes a difference, but we've seen neutral and positive uh, impacts of essentially like expanding that accordion, opening other tabs, uh, taking out of tabs and just making it a longer scroll, um, removing the read more link and just having it expanded uh, straight down. And that's both in the case where it's, I guess, the more obvious one, like the last point is where that's actually loaded asynchronously, so the content wasn't in the HTML. 
it loaded by JavaScript when you pressed yeah, it makes sense. read more. That's that kind of makes sense. Yeah. But we've even seen it in just the you know it was display none yeah. in CSS yeah. until you clicked on the tab, and um, we've seen that have an impact. We've also seen it have differing impacts on desktop and mobile. Um, and Google's yeah. line is that this matters particularly doesn't matter on mobile. Yeah, um, yeah. we have seen a smaller impact there, but we have yeah. seen some impact. So uh, this who knows how this is going to evolve. And it seems like what often, what often happens is Google's official line becomes the truth at some yeah. point in the future. So maybe they're moving towards this mattering less. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, we've certainly seen that's kind of an interesting. Nice. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's do a question. So um, uh, the first one, if, how do you go about split testing uh, pricing differences? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think this um, is kind of a procedural type question. So yeah. literally, how do you make this work in common shopping carts and, and that side of things? Oh, I see. Not, yeah, like, not like an ethical... No, no, no. I think that's an interesting question. Well, yeah. maybe we can touch on that. But yeah. the specific question is like, uh, you know, they need the price to be the same throughout the checkout and throughout into the cart, into the shopping cart. How yeah. do you handle that? I mean, that, that's relatively simple from a development point of view. Mm -hmm. And I am not a developer to the point <laughs> that I tried to fix an experiment yesterday and ended up breaking it. No, I mean it depends on it depends on how you want to make the change. Essentially, the, the first question you have to ask is essentially, are you actually going to charge customers different amounts? Yeah. Yeah. Or are you going to? Are some people going to see twenty pounds? Other people are going to see twenty five pounds, but they both just pay twenty pounds at the end. You're just paying a higher value to to see if they add to cart or exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And you run both of those plans. That's that's the type that we prefer. Okay. So we would, um, we and I think our customers would not be comfortable running an experiment in the same market where two customers are paying a different amount. Mm -hmm. um, it's yeah, it's, it's it's not really a good look for for us or them. I mean, yeah. even um, there was a news story a while back about um, I forget which website it was, but some website was reported as um, showing higher prices to people using MacBooks. Right. Uh, if you remember this one, I, I don't remember. But I can and I think the, the, the it. explanation was that um, people weren't, weren't actually being charged different amounts, but they were just showing Mac users a different type of hotel or holiday, or whatever the product was, because they knew that they would yep. choose a different. And, and it was it was that kind of uh, uh, decision making. So, and if there's that much stink about stuff like that, where they're not actually charging people different amounts, they're just offering your product, product yeah. Uh, well, yeah, the same products in a different order. Um, then charging two different people two different amounts is yeah, not very really good. Look. So yeah. the way that we would do it is twenty pounds, twenty five pounds. Show that on the uh, the page, product page, essentially everywhere up until the last possible moment. And then when you're in the checkout, and someone is about to press the pay button, you either just theoretically you can still show them the higher amount there and just charge their credit card the lower amount, or you could add in. A discount at the last minute. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, although even that is an legal fuzziness in terms of like, is it a discount if they were never going to pay? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, we, we, yeah. So yeah, we're normally just all side of all the stuff is, uh, ultimately no one's going to complain if they're being charged the lower amount. Is our yeah. mm -hmm. And so um, it just becomes a development question of how we modify that and keep that persistent. Okay. Yeah. But that's not a question that I'll be able to ask myself. <laughs> Good. Uh, the other question that uh, I thought was worth covering. This definitely. There's a version of this I can mention. I don't know how much it comes up on your side. So the the way uh, the way the question came in was, do we find having different pages of the same type, for example? Uh, Imagine you're running tests on category pages, for example. Uh, does it cause confusion to the user if they see different layouts as they move around the site? So yes. This is definitely a risk in the SEO testing world where we're taking all the category pages and we're making a change to some subset of them. But it's actually one of the reasons that we like that of introducing the full funnel uh, yep. concept. We do we actually prefer that in theory, um, even if you're only going to measure the SEO impact, purely because it means that that isn't the problem. Yep. Um, and, right. and the way that works is that we uh, we set a cookie on the first page you view, and whichever bucket you were in, you then get that experience mm -hmm. site-wide. And because Google is stateless and uh, making independent requests, Google sees variants on variant pages and control Good. on control yeah. pages. Um, but yeah, I mean, how, does that come up a lot in your, um, do you normally manage to roll out your control or your variant 
to the whole site so that you have consistent user experience? Typically, yeah. I mean, that's that's normally how we would do it. If we, if we can test across the entire template, then we absolutely would. Yeah. Um, that said, if we can't, the likelihood is that the, the negative impact is going to be minimal, such that if we can detect an uplift, then it's still a pretty solid case. And so we don't expect really it too much. Yeah. Um, it's certainly not. Like ultimately, what we're trying to do is make better decisions. We're not trying to mm. create medicine that has to be held to a much higher degree. Because the, the, the language we, we talk internally, language I mean, is uh, we're doing business, not science. Yeah. And we want to know the right answer, mainly so that we can roll out the right answer, not so we can publish a peer reviewed journal on this yeah. is always yeah. the right answer under every circumstance or has Absolutely. no risks or, or whatever. Um, yeah. So there shouldn't be an excuse to do lousy experiments or to not apply or to, to misapply the statistics, especially in terms of looking at confidence and duration and things like that. Yeah. But it also doesn't mean that you don't need to worry. You know, if you're running an experiment on your three biggest categories, but the tiny little category that people don't always go to is ethics, is that going to stop people from converting because there's a different design on those category pages? Yeah. Probably not. And I guess the worst way that messes up the test is it reduces the power of it. You, you fail to exactly. detect something exactly. from small yeah. marginal numbers. But yeah, it, just specifically on the SEO side, we actually haven't seen. Uh, I haven't seen it be a problem in practice. It's something we've worried about. Of, oh, but yeah, we, we've split this site section and we changed some and not changed others. Yeah. But actually, I think on most large websites, as you navigate around, not every page is exactly identical, even with a site section anyway. And enough other stuff is changing yeah. that pe people are taking like a snapshot of a page and then comparing it to a snapshot of another page. And yeah. Most people don't remember what's at the top of the page they're on. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, precisely. Uh, so um, in practice, we haven't seen that uh, be too much of a problem. Um, maybe last question, and then we'll um, I only have one final tip. Yeah. Um, is uh, what happens when everybody starts getting the same results and all sites look the same? It's a really good point. It's um, so this is this is why we like the idea of you know essentially don't look at copying what your competitors are doing. Don't do the same as everyone else because then you get the same results as everyone else. Yep. Like this is why experimentation is so important. It, it means that you can take those risks with a safety net. And this is actually quite a nice lead into the fifth point, which is essentially the, the test idea is more of a, a question, which is what would you test if you knew you can fail? Ultimately, that's mm -hmm. what experimentation gives us a way not to fail or to, to limit, to massively limit, limit that exposure. Uh, so when we ask clients that question, it's often things like, well, um, you know, we've got a client that wants to move away from discounting. Um, they've got a huge percentage of customers who are returning customers mm -hmm. who are used to getting an email. They wait for that, or they yeah. search for email for it, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And they are they're concerned that essentially they're stuck with this issue for life, and they're not going to be able to move away from it. Mm -hmm. But actually, it gives us a perfect opportunity for experimentation to focus on how can we optimize the emails to still mm -hmm. drive people through to the website without that. How can optimize product pages and the, the rest of the e-com website so that it's less about the discount and more about the, the products or other things to take that place? Um, that even means that we can do pricing experimentation as well. Mm -hmm. you know, would the site support similar levels of discounting but with a higher starting price? So the net result is the same. Like yeah. these are if if someone knew that they couldn't fail, they are much more likely to take these drastic, more extreme, more aggressive, more ambitious mm -hmm. um, measures. And that's when we, that's exactly the, what we should be doing to avoid kind of doing the same as, as everyone else and getting the same kind of yep. Yep. Murky, boring website. That makes a ton of sense. And I think, um, oh yeah, I mean, the, I don't know if you see quite the same thing, but also on the click-through rate side that I was talking about earlier, standing out is one of the, mm. um, <coughs> most influential parts of that kind of thing. So yeah. yeah, quite often you do kind of get this, I think it's just the best practice convergence, right? It's just like everybody copies whoever's at number one because they must have done it right. But Amazon and then everyone starts them. standing up. Uh, and then, yeah, and then obviously if everybody's standing up, no one is. And uh, yeah, so that does also lead to some of the funnier tests of uh, yeah. what, uh, Amazon put emojis in front of that. Um, 
Yeah, sure. Yeah. Anyway, um, the the final one I wanted to mention was the was about the overlap of uh, okay, I've mentioned a couple of times about full funnel testing, but the what do we do when we have a test that is positive in one mm -hmm. factor and negative in the other? So, for example, good for conversion rate but bad for certain performance. Yeah. And this is not theoretical that we've seen this in a while. One of the first full funnel tests we got to run was a uh, complete template overhaul of a uh, category page uh, okay. on a, a customer site. They had put a bunch of work into this. Uh, they tested it for user experience, you know, but it was positive mm -hmm. user experience enhancement. Um, we got to test it from uh, before they pushed it permanently, yep. and it was significantly negative uh, okay. on the search performance side. Yep. And I mean, luckily, I mean, luckily we tested it, yep. but also um, that wasn't then just the recommendation to not just throw this all away. It no, was um, okay. Now we've got we've got all kinds of interesting data here. We can go back to the hypotheses that led yep. us to build it this way in the first place from a conversion rate and user experience perspective. We can also unpick yep. the search side of it and say, you know, is this click through rate? Is it okay. meta information? Is it uh, you know, do, do, do we have um, have we broken something on mm -hmm. the on the search side? Um, and a sense of try and get trying to iterate to get yep. to the best of both worlds. And um, this I mean, simple, simple examples like you might find that it's good for conversion experience to have less content on the page, but good for a search experience to have more content on the page in a particular yeah. situation. Yeah, sure. um, and that's where your design can come into it. So you can say, okay, well, let's have content on the page, but de-emphasize it. And probably not put it behind the tab, but you yeah. know, maybe you put it down the page or yeah. uh, make the image bigger or like, target the same hypothesis with different yeah. uh, approaches. Presumably, I, I mean, when we talk about these sorts of topics, the assumption that, that I'm in person is that um, Google or the search engine wants, like, their product is the search results and they want to give, they, they want to want people to the right website, essentially. Mm -hmm. That's not really the way of phrasing it. Yeah, totally. like, and so if your design converts better than it did before, mm -hmm. assuming that you're tracking something that's meaningful, like performance conversion rate, for example, then it presumably means you're giving the customer a better experience, and that should be rewarded by Google as opposed to penalized. So you, in theory, in, in yeah. theory that's the case, but I guess it, it's um, presumably the behavioral factors are less, are, are, are not a... Yeah, well, so there's a few things to unpick in there. I think, um, firstly, at a zoom out level, that's why we feel good about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. That's why we feel like SEO testing is a good thing, yeah. because we are actually aligning with this is you, the same reason I imagine you do. You know, you're like, we, we've tested to see if people prefer product A or product B. They prefer product B, and we brought product B to market. Like, we've done a good thing yep. um, to, to, for the world in some like, mission driven type sense of it. Yep. We have that same thing of like, we're helping people find, we're, we're making this site genuinely better. So yep. we're getting a better search experience. And yes, that's totally aligned with what search engines want. So we feel good about that. Mm. There's a bunch of tactical reasons why it might not yeah, for sure. work that way in the short run. You could break stuff, right? You could just you can miss out your metadata, or you, you know, there's, there's things that yes, the user, things the user cares about relatively little, mm. but uh, Google still emphasizes for, for variety, or Google displays the search results, or yeah. whatever else. Um, and that's one one way it can go wrong. Another way is that a lot of it is still kind of somewhat traditional ranking factors, and yeah, there sure. are yeah, you know, there is just this user experience thing, but there's a lot of open questions about how explicitly yeah. they're measuring it. We tend to think. But it, yes, it converges over. What's the is it Warren Buffett's quote about how um, uh, the in the short run the stock market is a um, popularity contest. In the long run, it's a weighing machine. Okay. Um, I, I, I misquoted that line that quite horribly, but it's essentially like stuff bumbles around in the short yeah, run. Yeah, yeah. But in the long run, the successful companies are the ones that make money and yes. uh, do, uh, do well. As a kind of simple thing, like Google is. Getting to rewarding the yeah. right things, yeah, yeah. but in the short run, it's, it's still a blunt instrument that is making assumptions based on. I, I guess it has to make assumptions based on your on-page factors and yeah. a bunch of other stuff. In Especially out in the in the kind of longer term, yeah. um, where you've got queries that maybe they've never seen before, uh, they don't have all that usage data yeah. To, yeah. to know what the right answer is. Yeah. They're using a ton of heuristics and have to, so yeah. it's never going to be perfect. But we feel like we're we're aiming for the same. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, which is probably a good place to 
wrap up, I guess. Um, and you want to help the audience before we, what, 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 how, how do they find you, where do they follow you, um, what do they, what's the get from promoting that? Sure, so the best thing to do is to take a look at the blog uh, at conversion.com. Uh, so we publish a lot in terms of, we're very keen to share more about our approach and how we think of what we do. Um, so you can find our approaches to create an experimentation framework that would probably be a good place to start. Um, we've also published our approach to prioritization, which is probably the mm -hmm. single most underrated skill in commercial okay. optimization. Yep. To the point that in about half an hour, we've got a session in the office just on prioritization. So um, definitely worth a, a read as well. Fantastic. And as I mentioned at the outset, if any of you would like to join us at our search live conferences, it's distilled.net slash events. Everyone, thank you for joining us. See you soon.